All right, thank you. Okay, we should have it by the time you log in here. So. Okay. Sorry about that. We no just worries. Had a couple of. Okay. Hello, and hello to you who are on the broadcast sites. We're going to go ahead and do some multitasking here. I'm going to do the introduction while we have some um, slide changes going on. So we are delighted that you are here today for the uh, Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics Ethics Lecture. Um, I'm Robin Axel Adams. I'm the manager of the center. We are recording our, um, our lecture today, and we're broadcasting it to a variety of sites around the, the uh, Indiana. So thank you for joining us. Um, just as a reminder, because it's so easy to forget, to, to silence your phone um, so that um, if you have to take a call, we ask that you step out and do so. And I also need to say that Dr. Halverson has no financial conflict of interest to disclose. So if you were at our lecture last month, or actually it was last month, but just a couple of weeks ago since we delay our January one, you heard um, Kevin Armstrong talk about the I, IU Health and the IU um, School of Medicine's enterprise goals and the ways that the, the two together are going to focus on trying to make Indiana um, one of the healthiest states. And one of the ones that he talked about is smoking sensation. You've probably seen tons of information out there as IU Health is trying to encourage you to contact your legislatures. And there are a variety of ways that, um, that this issue is going to be tackled. And so when we were looking for speakers and who could come and talk to us about this, the number one name that kept coming up was Dr. Halverson. And, and I continue to hear about the ways that you talk about it around the state. So let me introduce him to you. Um, Dr. Halverson is the founding dean and professor of the Indiana University Richard M. Fairbanks School of Public Health at IUPUI. Prior to his appointment at IU, um, Dean Halverson served for eight years as the director and state health officer of the Arkansas Department of Health and a member of the governor's cabinet. Dr. Halverson also served as the director of the Division of Public Health Systems Development and Research, as well as the WHO Collaborating Center Director for Public Health Practice at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where he served as a member of the Senior Biomedical Research Service. Prior to his appointment in public health, Dr. Halverson served as a hospital administrator in Minnesota and Michigan. So this last week wasn't too awful for you then. All right. Uh, Dr. Halverson's research interests focused on public health systems and service research, primarily focused on public health infrastructures and organizational effectiveness. So I know his slides are not quite up yet, and I know they're working on them. But um, until we get them up, we'll just welcome you and see what, how we can help you move forward. Thank you. And here is water for you. Oh, great. Thank you so much. It's uh, terrific to be here today. Thank you. Oh. We had a couple of last-minute uh, changes in the slides, and I'm afraid that uh, we didn't synchronize them. We'll get them in just a second. Talk about pressure for this guy, though, right? <laughs> I don't know how many of you had a chance to, uh, if, if you listen to uh, No Limits on WFYI, we were on yesterday, I uh, had the opportunity to, to uh, uh, participate in a uh, conversation with John Kroll. He, he, he does a great job, I think, in terms of um, that program, and we talked a lot about um, tobacco policy and tax policy and so forth, so it's always... Um, um, it's always interesting to me to um, have the conversation and, of course, uh, doing it live with uh, call-in uh, uh, people, is, it's always uh, uh, a little bit of a challenge, but I thought there were great questions. And we're in the midst of a policy discussion at the legislature around tobacco tax, and we'll talk about that a little bit um, today as well. So we're going to talk about the current state of smoking status and prevalence in Indiana. It's uh, uh, in, if, uh, in case you're wondering, it's not a good story. Um, we also have a number of ethical issues, as you might imagine, around tobacco cessation and about tobacco use in general. And, um, and that's not frequently talked about. So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit today. And then also um, look at some uh, possible policy options, which ultimately it, which is not that uncommon for public health issues. Policy uh, frequently drives good public health um, policy and, and, and public health change. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So Indiana has ranked among the lowest uh, states in health status for several years. But um, the bad news here is that we're going backwards. 
when I first came about uh, nearly six years ago, we had been 41, and in fact, we got little buttons that said, we're done with 41. Uh, the good news is we didn't have to buy buttons for a while because we stayed at 41 uh, as a state in terms of our overall health status until year before last uh, when we were ranked 38th. Now, 38th is not so great, but we're back to 41. Uh, unfortunately, in the last rankings that came out by the United Health Ranking, the, the longest standing organization uh, that independently ranks states as it relates to their health put Indiana back to 41, and in large part, uh, it is because of our uh, tobacco use rate. So we ranked uh, we rank 44th in the nation in adult smoking. Um, we were 41st. We're now 44th. So uh, it, we seem to be in the 40s, right? Smoking is 44. Our overall ranking is 41. Guess what is the largest driver of rankings? Tobacco use, right? So smoking is the primary contributor to low health status here in Indiana. We're at 21.8%. Uh, we're going in the wrong direction. The U.S. rate is 17.1%, and the best uh, state is actually 8.9% in Utah. Can it be done? Yes. Could we, even if we got to average, we'd be doing a lot better than we are right now. And, of course, those of us in the health professions know the terrible impact that smoking has on the health of the, of the population and the health of our patients. Uh, there is no greater cause of death in our state but um, tobacco. If you look at the disease uh, for which people die, we'll see heart disease, cancer, and stroke. But guess what? The leading cause or the leading behavior that, that uh, uh, creates that uh, disease is actually related to tobacco use. And so to, we know that uh, poor health status is bad for business. This is a real uh, juxtaposition of our state, because if you look at our uh, leading business indicators, we're doing quite well. Um, if you look at our health indicators, uh, as well as we're doing, we're doing, uh, uh, frankly, uh, we're in the poor end, and in fact, we're in the the lowest uh, uh, 20 percent. So um, this really creates a, a real challenge for us. So again, if we look at tobacco use, nine out of 10 uh, deaths from lung cancer, three out of 10 uh, deaths from all cancers, eight out of 10 cases of COPD, and three out of 10 uh, deaths for heart disease caused by um, tobacco use. And um, lest anyone think that that uh, uh, tobacco doesn't uh, uh, hurt in other diseases. The reality is we know that tobacco makes everything worse. Um, and it, again, if you, you've been in the health professions for any length of time, you know um, the devastating effect of tobacco on, uh, on the human body. If we look at lung cancer in Indiana, uh, here we can see the, the uh, shaded um, uh, counties in our state actually relate to the extent of lung cancer mortality. And if we look at the little diamonds uh, uh, and their color, you can see the percentage of current smokers. So there seems to be a fairly um, tight alignment uh, around heavy smoking and um, lung cancer. We also see that there's a difference in uh, smoking uh, mortality as it relates to white-black. And that's, again, hopefully not a surprise to you, uh, but certainly is uh, shameful in many ways. Uh, if we look at tobacco use overall, um, it, every year we lose approximately 11,100 people from tobacco-related diseases. That's about 65 Boeing 737s crashing each year. If we had 65 airplane crashes full of people every year, uh, I would dare say we would stand up, take notice, and fix the problem. We have had over 11,000 people dying of tobacco-related diseases in this state for years and years and years, and it is commonplace. Kids alive today who will die prematurely from smoking, uh, over 151,000 children whose lives will be cut short because they are affected by tobacco. 
For every pack of cigarettes sold in the state, Indiana spends $15.90 in health care costs related to smoking and lost productivity. Overall, that number for the cost of tobacco is about $7.6 billion a year that we lose and that we spend in health costs and related productivity losses. Um, if we look at the, just the health care costs alone, it's nearly $3 billion. Medicaid costs are uh, $589 million. This uh, cumulatively uh, has an impact on all of us that live and pay taxes in Indiana. About $982 per household uh, can be attributed to the cost of uh, smoking. So this is important because there are some that would say, you know, if somebody else wants to smoke, why do I care? Well, why we care is because we're all paying a hidden tax, and I, what we're trying to do is to help people understand that uh, we're all um, impacted by our uh, high use of tobacco. The smoking productivity loss is about $3.2 billion. It's been estimated that every employee that smokes in Indiana actually gets the benefit of about three additional weeks of vacation. If you look at the smoke breaks that, uh, that smokers take and the excess uh, absenteeism and presenteeism related to uh, productivity, uh, that's a substantial cost to every employer. And uh, again, it's an important uh, thing to recognize. This last statistic is important for us all in health to recognize that uh, Indiana, in Indiana, tobacco companies spend in excess of $300 million per year in uh, tobacco-related advertising and marketing. That is, uh, that is in, in addition to uh, the amount of money spent by uh, tobacco companies and, and lobbyists and political donations. Any uh, tobacco lobbyists in the room? <laughs> Believe it or not, we frequently have them. Most of the time, they don't raise their hand, by the way. Um, so when you ask uh, what, can we, what can have the greatest impact on health and improve prosperity in Indiana, there's really only one simple answer, and that's to reduce tobacco use. In fact, both Dean Hess, uh, the dean of our medical school, and I were asked to participate in a statewide uh, strategic planning retreat, and that question was asked of both of us, and our answers were the same. Uh, tobacco use uh, remains the, the single greatest opportunity for improvement. And this actually uh, uh, ran on Sunday. I don't know how many of you may have seen it. Um, I'm grateful for the Indy Star in running that um, op-ed piece. But it, again, um, it, as you'll see the theme of this talk, uh, what we really need is the political will to pull the policy levers that ultimately we know will change this. So that's the other uh, part of this, which is the single most effective way to reduce uh, tobacco use is to increase the price. So for every 10% increase in cigarette price, we know reliably that that will decrease cigarette um, consumption by 3 to 5%. Um, so if, if, in fact, we're able to raise the price, which generally means raising the tax, uh, we can count on um, according to studies that go back, hundreds of studies that go over the last 30 years that have been done, this is settled science. Uh, there is a linear relationship between tobacco tax and price of the product and um, consumption. And, and, uh, and by the way, it's not evenly distributed. The greatest benefit occurs to people who are of low income and um, our, our kids. Um, particularly effective in reducing uh, uh, use in high-risk populations. Again, one of the things that we've seen, and we'll talk a little bit later, is actually the targeted marketing by uh, tobacco companies in, in placing distribution outlets in urban, low-income minority areas uh, because they know um, that, that they have actually a higher likelihood of being successful in convincing um, uh, these people to smoke. And this creates, a, again, a very disadvantageous uh, situation when we look at disparities. <clears throat> so here's just part of the evidence that you can see as cigarette prices as are represented by, um, actually, as the price goes up and the price is in the green, 
um, the sales go down. And this was uh, this is looking 1970 to 2014. And if you look at most of the reductions in other states, it's been as a result of raising um, the the tobacco uh, tax. <clears throat> Again, this is Indiana. The previous one was the U.S., but it's, it, there are people that would say, you just don't understand, Dr. Halverson, we're different in Indiana. Uh, this doesn't normally work, and so here I want to show you that, it, yes, it does, in fact, work pretty well. Uh, so if we can raise the price, we can see a reduction in tobacco use. So one of the things that uh, we frequently hear is this is an unfair tax on the poor, and, uh, and therefore, because it's so regressive, um, this is just unfair, and therefore we shouldn't do it. Uh, the reality is, when we look at who pays the tax, this was actually the uh, last time we increased the federal tax rate on tobacco, went up a dollar. Um, and when we look at who, who actually pays the bulk of the increased tax, what we see is those people that are at two times the poverty level actually paid 67% of the increased tax. Uh, but look over on the far left, and you'll see the po those that are below the poverty line actually wound up having the greatest benefit. Uh, about 46% of the benefit of that increased tax actually accrued to that population group. And you say benefit, well, yes, the benefit is they quit smoking. Uh, and the reality is, is that the higher the price, particularly the, the price-sensitive populations, will tend to not smoke as much. Now, here's the important ethical consideration, and that is, if you raise the tax and therefore uh, force people out of the product, but you don't at the same time very aggressively provide mechanisms for them to quit, you have actually done harm, right? Because we know the addictive properties of tobacco, it's, it's, been, it's second only to uh, crack cocaine and its addictiveness. And we also know that the average person tries to quit about 11 times before they're successful. So therefore, uh, as we contemplate an increase in the tax, we also need to, we need to also at the same time be prepared to help people quit. And the good news is we know how to do that. Uh, nicotine replacement therapy, uh, uh, group, group and in individual counseling sessions. We know how to help people quit. We can do that successfully. What we don't want to do is just say, um, do it cold turkey and just quit, quit smoking. By the way, that, that also seems to be the perception. I had a chance to testify on opioids recently, and you would be amazed at the number of lawmakers that believe that the best thing to do is just tell people to quit. It, it doesn't work. Uh, we know it doesn't work, um, but um, again, that's science, and who knows about that. Um, so tobacco taxes and equity, again, as we think about um, the, the fact that this is about a tax, and in Indiana in particular, uh, taxes are, um, are not very favorable, uh, as you all know. Um, so the, what we do know, however, is that we've done some public polling, and we have oversampled uh, Republicans and uh, uh, folks throughout the state that would tend to lean in a very conservative uh, direction. And we see there's almost a 70% support of all people um, uh, polled around the importance and the value in a tobacco tax. Um, and um, there is a general agreement that the, the concerns about the regressivity of the tax are outweighed by um, the benefits directed to the poor. So again, um, there is a strong interest, I think, uh, from an ethical perspective in us looking at uh, addressing this issue very aggressively. Um, so again, as I've mentioned before, we really must raise the taxes at the same time uh, we offer interventions to curb overall use and to mitigate the SES and uh, race-based disparities. Um, it's an, it, and, I, and I think, again, th this is one of those issues where, um, and, and there are a lot of people that don't believe this, but regardless of how we use the money, raising the price of the product is the intervention. So uh, legislators in particular are very uncomfortable with that, uh, they think it's all about trying to raise more money for, um, you know, health reasons. And, of course, that would be great because, guess what, we rank 48th 
in our per capita spending on public health. So it would certainly be nice if we could spend a little bit more money on public health. But that's not the primary reason to raise the price. The primary reason to raise the price is to reduce use. So again, um, if we look at tobacco um, taxes, uh, we rank 38th in the nation, a uh, li little less than a dollar per pack. Uh, the average um, uh, is $1.73. Understand that there are some legislators that believe this is a really good thing because it drives tobacco sales in Indiana. And there's a belief, by the way, that people that live in the border states that have a higher rate come over here frequently buying tobacco. The reality is research is pretty clear. The average person buys tobacco uh, within blocks of their home, usually at a, at a, a convenience store, a gas station, usually the same. Um, and they buy one or two packs at a time. The thought is, is that people are so price sensitive, they'll drive an hour away, buy several uh, cartons, and, uh, and, and that's the way they consume the product. And the reality is that's not true. Uh, the health benefits that result from tax increases are very progressive. Uh, and again, this is one of the most important messages. Uh, so here, I hope you're getting the, the picture here, which is that we know how to fix this problem. Uh, what it requires is the political will in which to actually uh, uh, invoke the intervention, which is a higher price. So if we look um, again at the um, socioeconomic disparities, uh, we know that um, that we have uh, uh, roughly 26.1 percent of uh, people below the poverty line um, smoking, and at or above the poverty line is 13.9 percent. So uh, again, um, this is an important recognition, and the ethical considerations in looking at from a policy level being able to provide important benefits uh, to people that uh, not everyone suffers equally. And we know that to be true in a whole lot of areas within health, and this is certainly one of those areas. Um, so again, uh, smoking-related mortality, um, uh, if we look at it, at the differences in mortality, whites are at 22.3 percent, um, blacks 21.2, and Hispanics at 14.2. So again, uh, a lot of uh, differences in racial um, uh, disparities. Again, arguably a negligible difference between white and black. However, I will tell you, uh, it, you know, uh, this is not the case in all states. Uh, when I was the health commissioner in Arkansas, uh, we had substantially lower uh, mortality due to tobacco use and tobacco use generally. Uh, in minority populations than in, in majority uh, white populations. So this is a little different in Indiana, where we actually have higher uh, mortality and higher use. Um, again, menthol use uh, uh, and advertisement worsens uh, race-based disparities. 85% um, of African American uh, smokers use menthols. And we know that through interventions in some other states where they're actually moving to outlaw flavored tobacco products, uh, we, we can make a bigger difference in African American populations. Uh, however, it, it really, again, is important to recognize that this product usage has been driven by decades of concentrated um, advertising and marketing and, um, and we really need to, to focus on potentially uh, looking at some of the drivers. Um, again, uh, legislation that bans menthol-flavored tobacco products is being uh, done across the country. There are, there's also targeted community-level tobacco cessation programs. And uh, again, uh, those targeted programs fare much better than just general programs. And we know, for example, marketing, targeted marketing to specific uh, groups is much more effective than general marketing around tobacco uh, uh, overall. And there are certain triggers that are more important uh, to some users than others. And being able to address um, those things and communicate uh, tobacco cessation in a way that's um, sensible and that speaks to that population demographic is really important. 
Of course, part of, the, part of this is, in fact, recognizing that there is not just one way in which that we reduce uh, tobacco use. Certainly, tobacco price is the most effective strategy. However, there are five parts to an effective tobacco um, program, one of which is related, and one of the most effective ways is to uh, fund tobacco-related uh, counter-advertising. One of the, we in Indiana have one of the lowest uh, budgets for tobacco-related counter-advertising. In fact, our overall budget for Indiana is a little over $7 million. The CDC recommended minimum level of spending for tobacco prevention and cessation is in excess of $70 million. So we're, not, we're spending about one-tenth of the amount that is recommended for science-based um, interventions. Uh, so again, we, I, I, I referenced a study that's been done by the Polis Center looking at density of tobacco retailers based upon uh, both ethnicity uh, and, uh, um, and urban minority populations, and we do see substantially higher retail, retailer density. And again, we know the higher the density, the greater the opportunity to purchase the product, the greater the use. So. Um, again, this is good evidence uh, done by our colleagues at the Polis Center to describe um, the outlets, tobacco outlets. Uh, again, think about this as uh, the greater the opportunity, um, the, the greater the likelihood of purchase. And we also see, again, in, at point of purchase, uh, a tremendous amount of advertising done in, in the stores which are uh, geared uh, to specific demographics. <coughs> Here's an area that uh, is particularly concerning to me and I'm sure to you, and that's maternal smoking. Indiana is one of the leaders in the country in women smoking during pregnancy. Uh, the, the average for the state is around 13.5%. We have some counties in our state where the maternal smoking is in excess of 30%. I, I don't know about you, but I think you'd have to be born under a rock to not understand that tobacco use during pregnancy is a bad thing, uh, but it is still amazing to me that this problem persists and it is uh, incredibly uh, deleterious. We know that tobacco use during pregnancy causes birth defects, preterm labor, low birth weight, um, and sudden infant death sy syndrome, among other things. Um, there are specific interventions that are being used to target this demographic um, and we know the message is, uh, is pretty important. We also know, based upon our research, that the vast majority of women who are smoking during pregnancy want to quit. And so, again, providing the opportunity, creating the pathway that allows them to take the steps necessary is really important. So, again, our ethical duty uh, in terms of uh, the standards that we um, affixed to our profession is really important, uh, and, in, and as it relates to the ethical responsibility, we're not only interested in the patient, the, 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 the prospective mother, but also, of course, the baby and the health of the, the baby in terms of their inability to make independent choices, so therefore the greater um, ethical responsibility. So. Again, there's some uh, examples of neat uh, uh, interventions. Many of you I know are familiar with the Nurse Family Partnership, a great evidence-based strategy being used across the country. A major part of that intervention includes uh, assistance in, in tobacco use. Uh, also, uh, the Baby and Me Tobacco Free Program, which uses an incentive program. It's actually diapers for cigarettes. Um, in other words, if you can demonstrate the fact that you're not smoking during pregnancy, you can get additional diapers which uh, create an incentive. And again, it works well with the executive center in the brain. We're trading um, benefits. And, and it works, and it's cheap, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's being used effectively, not nearly as much as it could or should throughout our state, but this is one strategy. E-cigarettes, I know you've all heard of uh, some of the latest uh, issues with Juul, uh, but overall, uh, remember, an e-cigarette is actually a nicotine delivery device, and the Juul in particular uh, is a very effective uh, um, delivery device, and in fact, it, uh, it is not nearly as conspicuous, and you've probably seen 
uh, some of the current um, literature on this issue. The FDA is concerned enough about it, it's, uh, it's taking very aggressive actions to begin to, um, to look at finding ways in which to curb use. Uh, you might also have seen the fact that Juul was actually purchased by uh, the tobacco companies. And one of the things that they're interested in is the tobacco companies' uh, uh, relatively high level of success in dealing with regulatory matters. So uh, we can expect more aggressive uh, marketing, I'm sure, and uh, uh, pushback on regulatory reforms for the use of some of the, um, these e-cigarettes. Uh, so again, we see our own uh, Jerome Adams, our current Surgeon General, former uh, Commissioner of Health in Indiana, uh, declare uh, the recent surge in e-cigarette use among youth uh, at epidemic levels. And again, I, 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 Jerome is absolutely right, and we need to be concerned about this, uh, and we need to take action. So again, uh, part of the public health response should be to incorporate e-cigarettes into the smoke-free policies, preventing youth access to e-cigarettes, uh, regulation of marketing and educational initiatives. So there are a lot of strategies that we would look at. Um, I, again, there's a large body of scientific evidence in these interventions. Number one, again, is raising the price of the product. Second is to enact comprehensive indoor air laws. Um, you know, we in Indiana uh, usually take credit for having comprehensive indoor air laws, but our indoor air laws, frankly, have so many exceptions and holes in it that frequently national organizations and convention and tourism uh, uh, companies don't give Indiana credit for actually having this law because there are so many exceptions that frequently uh, we, it's not counted as being a, a benefit in the scoring for national organizations and conventions because, again, our, our laws are so um, loose, if you will. Uh, but we do know, for example, that, that tight indoor air laws and restrictions of uh, smoking in public places make a huge difference. The idea is, is actually to be quite um, inconvenient to, uh, to smoke and to make the healthy choice the easy choice, making unhealthy choices hard. Um, enacting um, the, the Tobacco 21 laws. Uh, again, we'll talk about this a little bit, but there's a, 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 a about six, six states and over 300 cities across the country have enacted Tobacco 21 legislation that, that restricts access to people over 21. Uh, currently, it's 18 in, in most states. Certainly, it's 18 here. It, it, it's actually a couple of things pretty easy to understand. One is, how many 16-year-olds uh, do you think know 18-year-olds? Quite a bit, right? Not many 16-year-olds know 21-year-olds. So if, you're a, if you actually prohibit 18-year-olds from buying tobacco products, you actually substantially interrupt the supply chain, and we can reduce uh, the number of people that actually are smoking because we know that 95% of the people smoke by the time they turn, uh, if they... If they're going to smoke, they start smoking by the, by the time they're 19. So the reality is, is if we can postpone that decision, we can, for the, for the most part, long-term reduce uh, overall smoking use. The other thing is we know uh, that the, the teen brain is not fully developed at 18. And in, in, in those of you who have had teenagers at 18, I can remember, uh, that's, they're not quite ready for prime time at 18. Uh, the brain is still developing. They don't always make the best decisions, and certainly making a decision related to tobacco use is, uh, is one that if we can f uh, forestall that decision, we hope, and, and, and it's been demonstrated that decision, better decisions will be made. Adequately funding tobacco control programs, and I mentioned this already, the tobacco control prevention program in Indiana uh, funded at a little over $7 million, CDC recommendation minimum $70 million, Remember, we also are participating in the Master Settlement Agreement where we get over $300 million a year from the tobacco companies for their egregious behavior in the past. The tobacco companies are laughing all the way because they're sending us over $300 million. We're spending just barely seven, and um, they recognize that there's not much effectiveness in the $7 million. In fact, there's a lot more that we can and should be doing. 
and again, implementing counter-advertising campaigns. How many of you have seen the uh, tips from former smokers? Evidence-based strategy works. It is absolutely predictable. If you run um, some of these ads, particularly the tips from former smokers, if you run that, you will drive up quit attempts at the, uh, to the quit line. And we know that that will have a very, a very high effect. Guess what, what are, what's one of the things that tobacco companies are pushing legislators to be most critical of? Media, media buys. Any, anything related to uh, running uh, mass, uh, mass media uh, advertising around tobacco use is, uh, is seen, uh, the, the idea by the tobacco companies is to push legislators to understand this is a big waste of time and money. Guess why they think that? because it is the most effective way in which to help begin to send the message and to change the culture related to use of tobacco. So here's the other thing that maybe you haven't seen, and that's Indiana is a member of something called the Tobacco Nation. Has anyone heard of that, the Tobacco Nation? So we're part of a group of 12 states, and if you looked at the, those 12 states as a separate country, you'd see that there are some striking differences. Uh, if you looked, for example, at the 12 states that are in Tobacco Nation, you'll see the median household income is substantially less, $45,000 in Tobacco Nation as compared to the U.S. population of 56,000. Uh, 17% higher um, poverty level, or 17% poverty level as compared to 15, 22% uh, with a college degree in Tobacco Nation, 28 uh, outside of Tobacco Nation. The regional uh, smoking disparities um, influence tobacco-related disease burden as well. So a smoker in Tobacco Nation smokes 26 more packs of cigarettes per year, which means inhaling over 500 more um, cigarettes than the average smoker in the rest of the U.S. So these disparities uh, within the geography of the 12 states are striking, and, and again, we need to think through uh, strategies that would begin to uh, have the maximal effect. Again, uh, if you look at the various tobacco control policies uh, in Tobacco Nation compared to the rest of the country, uh, you can see, for example, uh, in Tobacco Nation states, only two states have uh, workplace, restaurant, and bar uh, comprehensive laws as compared to 23 states that have them uh, in other places. So again, uh, you might ask, well, what kind of support is there uh, for tobacco control policies within those 12 states? You might find it interesting to know that for the most part, uh, those people actually living in tobacco, state, tobacco nation states uh, actually have higher level of support for um, uh, aggressive tobacco-related uh, controls. So again, if we look, so here's, for example, requiring tobacco products to be kept out of view in stores where youth shop, which is the place-based advertisement. 62% of the people that live in tobacco nation states say that that um, would be an important thing. Uh, the rest of the U.S., it's 52 percent. So again, um, strong differences. Uh, if we look at uh, charge smokers 25, per, 25 cents more per pack to pay for cigarette litter cleanups, I mean, which is pretty aggressive, uh, 56 percent of the people in, that live in those um, states say that they would support that. So uh, again, Tobacco 21, if we look at this, uh, 375 uh, municipalities in 22 states have raised, already raised uh, the minimum age to 21, six states. Um, and again, as we look at the opinion surveys done by CDC, 75% of adults favor raising the tobacco age to 21, 70% of current smokers agree, and 65% of those um, that are most affected at, at, in the age group of 18 to 24 agree this is a good thing. And by the way, in Indiana, we can't do this on a city-by-city -city basis because of preemption laws put in force, uh, in large part supported by the tobacco companies. They didn't want to 
uh, have to fight individual cities and municipalities and, and counties doing their own tobacco regulation. So they essentially um, got the legislature to pass a law that created a preemption that all, only the state can implement uh, certain tobacco control policies. And that's why we couldn't independently uh, implement a Tobacco 21 law in Indiana uh, on our own or, or at a, on a municipality basis, but must do it at a, on a statewide basis. But again, six other states have done it. And um, th that there is a bill in our legislature uh, now that's actually proposing that. So again, we'll see how that goes. Um, 90% of daily smokers first use cigarettes before the age of 19. So again, the, some of the demographic and scientific um, rationale for wanting to get uh, people to move to a Tobacco 21 policy. Um, so here's an interesting tidbit. And many of you may know that in the, in the large uh, tobacco um, lawsuits that ensued that ultimately resulted in the tobacco uh, master settlement, uh, a lot of internal tobacco company documents were disclosed. And here's a, here's a um, quote from one of them. Raising the legal minimum age for cigarette purchase to 21 could gut our key young adult market, which is 17 to 20, where we sell about 25 billion cigarettes and enjoy a 70% market share. I don't know about you, but that just turns my stomach. Um, so again, if, we, if the IOM has studied this, they looked at um, uh, the impact of a Tobacco 21 program, they would, they would in, uh, anticipate a 25% drop in youth smoking initiation, 12% drop in overall smoking rates. Uh, if Tobacco 21 were adopted nationwide, 4.2 million years of life loss prevented in kids alive today. Substantial benefit. Uh, simply by raising the age of acquisition. So again, if we think about it from an ethical perspective, protecting vulnerable populations, um, for example, teens and young adults who are still developing and may not possess the best decision-making capacities, is that society's ethical responsibility? Uh, I, I would say that it certainly is something we should consider. Um, there's also the issue of, um, and this just describes the differences in, um, in the brain development between, between 18 and 21, and we know uh, clearly that their brain is still developing at 18. Making um, some of these life choices is really important for us to uh, push back uh, so that, in fact, they can make a more informed decision. There's also this issue at, from an ethics perspective in individual liberties versus protecting the good of the public. And as a public health professional and former uh, public health uh, uh, officer, I can tell you that this is the kind of question that we're faced with every day. What's best for the greatest number of people, the highest level of utility for the greatest number of, the greatest number of people as compared to the individual liberties? And I've already mentioned to you the argument frequently by people that don't want to talk about uh, tobacco control is let, let people just do whatever they want to do. Uh, this is a live and let live society. Um, why do we care? And why we care is because of all of the subsidiary effects. Um, and and uh, it, it, we know that, they're not, that most people that are smoking are not living in the middle of the desert 100 miles away from everybody else. They are, in fact, impacting us either in our pocketbook or in our health, because we know that the number of people who are affected by secondhand smoke is uh, substantial and important to recognize. So um, we have had a mixed uh, success. In fact, probably uh, that would be generous. Um, we've tried. Uh, there is a, a, a number of organizations that are focused on trying to um, push uh, tobacco policy uh, at the legislative level, state legislative level. Um, there was a bill, House Bill 1380, uh, which had a $2 a pack increase. Um, it was uh, stripped uh, from the bill before it was passed. Um, there was uh, support for the Tobacco 21. Uh, the Public Health Committee uh, passed it out 9 to 0, uh, but 
as we know, the House Speaker killed the bill with a procedural move uh, to prevent a floor vote in the House. Uh, there was not a, a similar bill de um, developed in the Senate. Um, so again, uh, part of what, what I hope you would recognize is that um, from a public health perspective, uh, we can't do it alone. We really need to be able to focus on uh, some policy-related changes which ultimately require the legislature to take action. And there are a number of uh, things I think that um, we all can do, uh, you know, both corporately and individually. Um, there are statewide efforts uh, that, are going, that are ongoing. Um, there are a number of people that have taken their own time to go and testify in these bills. And again, uh, the legislature, here's a, a recurrent message from legislators that I've talked to over the last few years, and that is that um, while they hear from me and a few other people quite frequently, they're not hearing from their constituents. And so this is one of those issues where grassroots um, uh, discussion with legislators of uh, being able to have people that feel strongly about this issue talk with their legislators in the community, at the, at the grocery store, in church, wherever you can, whenever you can find them, is being able to talk and, and don't assume that they know uh, what the right thing is to do. Um, they really rely upon health professionals to help inform their decision making. And I, I again, would uh, strongly urge you to let your voice be known uh, and be um, um, pretty clear about the direction that needs that we need to take. So, again, the uh, counter marketing is very effective. Um, three, three. Uh, we know that the, the tobacco companies spend about three hundred million in tobacco marketing, um, which is a huge amount of money. I'll, I'll tell you one of the reasons why two dollars a pack is important, or it, it has to be at least a dollar is that a big part of this marketing budget uh, goes to price rebate coupons. And we know based upon past experience by tobacco companies in states that have raised the tobacco price by increasing the tax, they uh, pretty promptly and very targeted uh, uh, will send out coupons to current smokers that essentially blunt uh, the tobacco tax increase. So there are some that would say, well, let's raise it a quarter, let's raise it 50 cents. Well it doesn't take much for the tobacco companies to send out 50 cent or 75 cent coupons that ultimately uh, blunt that tax increase. It's easy for them to send those out for a period of time to make sure the person is addicted and then all of a sudden they're able to retain their market. So um, again, we have a, a big uh, battle ahead as it relates to the policy issues um, there also um, are important, as I said earlier, important ways in which we can target our message in particular uh, to populations that are more vulnerable and uh, to which we, I think, have a special duty and, again, um, that's important. As it relates to uh, health professionals, um, we know that screening is in place across IU health systems as every patient is asked the smoking status. That's really important. We need to continue to do that. But we also need to start doing something more aggressively about that health status information. I, I'm aware of the fact we now have an interface between uh, the EMR and the quit line, and we're beginning to, on an automate, automated basis, begin to uh, create notifications. That's terrific. Um, also recognize the evidence is pretty clear. Even three minutes with your patient to talk about uh, tobacco status and uh, tobacco use is an enormous, uh, has an enormous impact. And so uh, again, we need to help equip practitioners to be able to have an effective conversation to make sure that we have in all of our outpatient practices and uh, the uh, someone that's very knowledgeable about the the tobacco quit process and who can be a resource to make sure that we're being as aggressive as possible to address uh, smoking status. And I also understand the pressure for productivity. But what we know from the literature is that the more protocol-based interventions we, we actually develop, uh, that ones that don't require individual intervention, the more frequently we're able to see uh, substantial gains at a clinical level. So again, we have the data, we need to be more aggressive, and I think we need a system-wide 
um, strategy in addressing uh, tobacco use in patients. We, we also know that there are some really great programs specifically for pregnant moms that are smoking, as well as people with, with diagnosis of cancer, which again um, is important to work through. Intensive education programs for healthcare providers, I think, really are needed and necessary. And again, um, education and consulting services for executive and clinical leadership of healthcare systems, because as, as is mostly the case in, in, uh, in many of the public health initiatives, it's really a system change that's necessary that will have the greatest, in, in greatest impact um, in, uh, in moving forward. Supporting local uh, coalitions is important. One, one of the pillars of an effective tobacco prevention and cessation program is our local community um, uh, coalitions, particularly youth-related coalitions. But again, if you look at, at the most effective tobacco, anti-tobacco programs in the country, you'll find that there's always a very strong local component of people who are interested in reducing smoking and who create uh, a real change in culture in the community. And so one way in which we can help support reduction in tobacco use is to support local initiatives. Again, that's being done at a state level, but it could also be done as part of a hospital community benefit strategy. Um, again, there are other, a lot of other issues. Uh, HUD housing, we're beginning to see re restrictions and implementation of restrictions in housing uh, provided by HUD. Um, there's, uh, again, regulation of other tobacco products and the jewels and e-cigarettes and so forth. Local point of sale ordinances to control retailer density. Uh, some states have uh, restricted sales of tobacco in pharmacies. Of course, we saw the CVS uh, voluntary move to uh, do away with tobacco products in their store. We're pushing on others. I'd love to see Walgreens and Walmart uh, join that group. Uh, continue to push that. Multi-unit housing smoking bans, uh, smoking uh, pollution, the smoking butts and so forth. Health system transformation, again, I, I hold out that we have a lot of opportunity if we think smart about, about the smoking use uh, as a health system, we can take, uh, take a good, um, uh, take the lead from other systems that have been successful. Tobacco-free movies and video games, interestingly enough, we know that science is actually very solid on the influence of tobacco use in movies. You may think, well, that's really kind of far out. It really isn't, actually. Uh, we can track um, the, inc the, the number of times product placement in movies actually generates tobacco, um, tobacco sales. And, by, re and by, uh, 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 by actually adding tobacco as one of those factors in the rating of, of, uh, of movies, it, it actually has an impact. Interestingly enough, we've seen an upsurge in tobacco placement in movies, and that's actually not been helpful at all. <clears throat> tobacco cessation during substance abuse counseling is, uh, again, a long-term, um, uh, and that, that's not new. It's just important for us to recognize. There, there was this viewpoint, by the way, which is uh, held by most of us in the health professions, which is, we really need to not restrict smoking in, uh, in addiction um, and mental health services. Uh, did you know that the leading cause of death for people in mental health inpatient units is not mental health related diagnosis, but is actually smoking? Um, they, they, die, they die more frequently of lung disease than they do from the um, uh, mental health uh, diagnosis. So again, we, we work with mental health uh, hospitals and institutions uh, to, to address that issue. So, sorry for the, um, uh, the quick delivery, but I had a lot to say. I'm happy to answer any questions you have or take any comments, complaints, or suggestions. Thank you very much. For those at our broadcast sites, because we had to change slides, um, the number that you can text calls to or text questions to is 317-502-7621. So 502-7621 if you're at a broadcast site. All right, we have a question here. Hi. Um, so I know that the Indiana General Assembly is currently in session now, and I've heard about, the two, again, them trying to get the $2 tobacco tax. Right. Um, can you speak more to 
where you see that going? Because I know I've heard about the Indiana 21 and right. what the timeline is for that and if we are trying to reach out to our legislatures, when the key points are to reach out to them. Yeah, so I think, um, again, not to get too detailed in strategy, but um, we've seen the House uh, uh, be very supportive of, um, or generally supportive of a tax increase. I think uh, their strategy now is they're kind of waiting for the Senate to take, to take some lead in this effort because, again, I, I think the House is saying, why should we you know, spend time on this if the if it's not going to go anywhere in the Senate. So, I think uh, right now um, we're very interested in finding some uh, folks in the Senate who are interested in in moving this uh, policy issue forward. I think Tobacco Twenty One is actually being heard today in the Health Committee. Um, again, one of the one of the concerns is that at least the the I, I understand. And talking with folks, that um, there is some concern about a number of exemptions that are currently in the law and a very long uh, phase-in uh, sort of uh, approach. There's interestingly enough uh, an exception, for example, for military. We know from talking to military uh, commanders and those that uh, are involved with uh, recruit training and so forth, they are not interested at all in having a military exception because they can't get people through. Uh, basic training now as it is, and so as a consequence, um, uh, you know, they don't allow smoking and they don't want an exception. Uh, but again, um, and it's, it's also interesting that we've also heard that the tobacco companies seem to be very interested in supporting watered down Tobacco 21 legislation. Um, because if you if you create the illusion you're doing something, then maybe you could then say, well, don't pick us on, don't pick on us anymore because we're we're doing something. We know that Tobacco 21 is important. It's the best one of the best long-term strategies, but we also know that raising the price of the product is the most effective strategy. All right, I think we have time for one more question, Dr. Helft. I wanted to raise a more radical um, issue. So, for decades and decades, the U.S. public has subsidized through tax uh, means the yes. tobacco companies themselves. Um, which we continue to do, and then we pay on the back end. They yeah. make a product which has zero redeeming value of right. any kind except for their own economic. The, so the market cap of all of the six major tobacco companies is somewhere in the neighborhood of six or eight hundred billion dollars. So you could, the U.S. government could literally just buy the tobacco companies out and save, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars amortized over 10 to 20 years. Yeah. Why? That's a great strategy. <laughs> I, I recognize that this is totally That'd be a pine, great buy, too, by the but way. But you didn't raise that issue, and I just wondered yeah. if that is in too pie in the sky. Well, I, I, frankly, I haven't heard that strategy mentioned. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting, and from an economics perspective, you're absolutely right. It would be a best buy if I were the... If we if we represented the government and said you know gee we we're paying this much more if we could make a one-time payment and be done with it we'd have a whole lot this do away with it you may find it interesting again a couple of issues one is uh, the, you may have heard this to uh, the state of Hawaii has uh, the bill has been introduced to actually eliminate tobacco in the state of Hawaii starting uh, with uh, uh, restricting tobacco use to people 30 and older and then phasing it in over time to actually eliminate tobacco. Um, usually, frankly, when you hear people talk about eliminating tobacco, believe it or not, it's usually the tobacco companies that are pushing that strategy because they know it's so radical that it will derail the whole conversation. And, you know, the reality is, is we know what happened with prohibition. Uh, when you prohibit something, it just generally doesn't work very well. So I'm all for taxing the heck out of it. In fact, I've gone on record when I was the health commissioner and saying $20 a pack would be a great uh, idea for me. Um, we know that in New York, for example, it's over $10 a pack. Um, there, there really is no redeeming value whatsoever, and we know the, the deleterious health effects. So. Thank you so very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming.